Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, let me uh, say how pleased I am to have the invitation to speak to this event this afternoon. Uh, let me, by the way, before I dive into my uh, remarks, make the link to what we just heard. So I'm going to go much more to the short-term uh, dimension of macroprudential policy. Uh, but there is, there is a link, um, which is if, uh, well, we know the history of the last 10 years, which is uh, one reason maybe why all of the action on, say, climate change has been delayed was dealing with the crisis. And, you know, of course, if you have a financial crisis, everything else is put on hold. So, uh, you know, I, I gave a speech during the summer basically making this point. Uh, you have to have a short-term stability in order to have the oxygen and the space to tackle long-term issues, whether it's uh, climate change or the implications of ageing for the financial system. So uh, that's my bridge between uh, that session and what I want to talk about. Um, I think, uh, again, before I get going on, on the two points I want to make, uh, the fact that currently I'm the chair of the Advisory Technical Committee of the ESRB means I get to see a lot of the work in progress uh, across the, the system. And previously, uh, before I took on my current job, I was chair of the Advisory Scientific Committee. So the ESRB uh, means a lot to me. Uh, and uh, let me emphasize is, is uh, when we think about this, uh, the work, who, who does all the work behind uh, what you see on the website? It's the uh, Secretariat. It's the staff of the ECB, uh, the staff of the uh, various national competent authorities, uh, the staff of the European supervisory authorities and the Commission. Uh, when I chaired uh, the task force on safe assets uh, last year, uh, again, if you go to that, you just see what, what's possible when so many people, so many institutions can come together. But today I want to focus on two points. One is, what is the role of macroprudential policy uh, in an upswing. So we know now in Europe we're, we're solidly in a phase of economic expansion. And uh, the question is, uh, how, how should the stance of macroprudential policy respond? And then second, uh, a bit similar to uh, President Draghi's point earlier on, uh, we know now that with the more and more of the uh, assets of the financial system intermediated through non-banks, how do we uh, think about macroprudential policy? How do we think about monitoring financial stability vis-a-vis -vis the non-bank financial system? So if I think about the, the first question, which is the upswing in the financial cycle, uh, well, this is really, in many ways, uh, the, the, the time has come for the ESRB. That one reason why the ESRB was set up was the recognition that uh, the last crisis, and indeed many historical crises, have been uh, driven by excessive leverage uh, during the up cycle. So when you have excessive leverage, uh, there's increased vulnerability to negative shocks. And uh, if such a shock occurs, it also makes it more difficult, more costly to resolve a crisis. You get more persistent uh, downturns and uh, a lot of uh, difficult uh, costs associated. Uh, so we know uh, that that's, I think, the consensus view of the crisis we've had. If you go back to uh, Levin, Valencia, Reinhardt, Rogoff, Schulerach and Taylor, it's really an age-old story. And again, if you, people who look at the mid-2000s and they say, well, the counterfactual, what if we had the toolbox we have now and we had that uh, toolbox and it was used in the mid-2000s? Let me cite two papers. One is the American Economic Review paper by... Uh, Philippe Martin and Thomas Philippon, which came out last year. And that's a very nice paper about the Euro area, about individual countries in the Euro area. And they're basically able to do a very nice empirical study where if limits on leverage had been imposed, the scale of the boom and bust cycle would have been much milder. The costs would have been a lot less. Equally, uh, there's a recent Bank of England paper which shows uh, that, again, if we had limited leverage of both the financial system and of households in the mid-2000s, the crisis could either have been avoided or mitigated. So I think uh, we now have uh, very solid evidence that uh, the alternative to having macroprudential policy, uh, we, we've tried that, so let, maybe let's try this time to actually use it. So uh, President Draghi mentioned earlier on that more and more countries are turning on different uh, 
measures. So the counter-cyclical capital buffer is being turned on in different countries. Uh, we turned it on this summer. Of course, with a one-year lead time, uh, you announce now, it uh, takes effect one year from now. And uh, across all of the countries associated with the ESRB, uh, 20 countries have also introduced borrower-based measures. And I'll come back to the link between uh, those measures and the cycle in a, in a couple of minutes. Now, the logic of the uh, counter-cyclical capital buffer is straightforward. If an additional capital buffer is imposed during upswings, then this should make the banking system more resilient uh, in a future downturn because that capital buffer can be switched off. The extra capital uh, accumulated during the upswing uh, can be released. And therefore, the kind of uh, pro-cyclical, uh, deepening the recession type of uh, withdrawal of credit supply that uh, some banks uh, engaged in to, to preserve capital in a crisis, that can be avoided. So it's really, it's a, really, it's a resilience issue. Um, in the, when the sun is shining, uh, prepare for the rainy day. Now, one basic point here, and this has motivated us in how we decided to switch this on, is this should be done early. Because if you wait too long, uh, especially when there's a one year lead time, you may be too late. So in assessing the timing, how much evidence do you need to accumulate? How many cyclical indicators need to be flashing uh, at you? Our assessment, and I cite in the, in the written speech, which is on the Central Bank website, I cite the work we've put into that to show uh, the, the, the benefits are high of an early switch on and the costs are fairly limited. So I think that that's an important point because all these countries are trying to work out how to use this instrument. And I think an early switch on, I'm convinced by that. Um, second, I, in calibration, so you've decided to switch it on. Then the question is to calibrate. How, how, what size of buffer should you uh, look for? And so here, I think the, the natural way to think about this is to think about, well, how quickly will capital deplete in a downturn? Um, in order to keep banks, the banking system safe and resilient, what kind of buffer is needed to deal with a cyclical uh, risk? And of course, there's, there's a close connection with how we think about stress tests in thinking about that. But let me point out two factors that are relevant in that discussion. One is, I think it's inescapable that a country with a high stock of non-performing loans is intrinsically more exposed to cyclical risk. I mean, just, uh, you know, we, we all believe that the recent improvement in macroeconomic conditions has been a, a pretty dominant factor in the decline in non-performing loans across Europe in the last couple of years. So uh, if that's true, I think it's obviously true. Then what is true is if we had a cyclical reversal, if we had a downturn, then uh, some of those non-performing loans, uh, which look better, may no longer look better, may, uh, may start to uh, not perform again, because essentially in a downturn, if people lose their jobs, if businesses lose re sale, sales revenue and so on, it's more difficult for a debtor to maintain uh, compliance with the terms of a loan contract or to com comply with the terms of, re of a restructure. So especially if there's inadequate provisions for the NPLs, I think there's a pretty direct connection between the stock of NPLs and the optimal value of the CCYB. You need to build a bigger cyclical buffer if you have a, a, a large stock of unresolved NPLs. The second point I want to make is that uh, there's not really a clean division between cyclical risk and structural risk. So uh, there's a, there was a recent uh, ESRB study uh, earlier this year about structural buffers. And part of that has a discussion about the interaction with the cycle. And I think uh, one particular example is, imagine uh, you have a systemic risk buffer, uh, a structural buffer, which is really to capture overexposure to real estate. Now, you can imagine a real estate crash independent of a, the business cycle. It could happen for exogenous reasons. On the other hand, it's difficult to imagine a general recession which does not generate losses on real estate loans. So I think uh, that's an example where there's going to be a, a clear cyclical element. So if a, some, a country has imposed a systemic risk buffer, uh, even though the, the, the theological reasons are structural there, it does de facto provide some cyclical protection as well. 
So if a country has a, a, essentially is delivering cyclical protection through other types of buffers, then the correct calibration of the CCYB would be less. So I think the holistic assessment of how much cyclical protection is in the system, no matter what the label on the buffer is, I think is quite important. And as I say, uh, in advertising, the work of the ESRB, the Structural Buffer Report, earlier this year goes into a lot more detail and gives a lot more examples. Now, if I turn to borrower-based measures, again, these might be thought of as structural or steady-state measures, but I think if you look at the history of how uh, the distributions of loan-to-income ratios, loan-to-value ratios, debt service-to-income ratios, and so on, move over the cycle, it's clear, I think, that uh, under cyclically strong conditions, there's a, typically a reassessment both by banks and by uh, households, that essentially uh, life is, uh, the future looks bright, and what might be deemed a risky ratio uh, suddenly is now deemed as okay. So in the absence of ceilings, in the absence of limits, uh, I, the, I think the distribution becomes more right-tailed for these ratios. And so if we now have a system where more countries have these ceilings in place, then the cyclical drift in these ratios may be less severe in the future. And uh, again, if you believe you've limited the boom bust cycle uh, because of, of those uh, fixed ratios, then I think you're going to have a, 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 a lower amplitude of the cycle. And again, a lower amplitude of the cycle, by the way, will feed into the calibration of the CCYB. Uh, let me finally, just on this cyclical issue, talk about fiscal policy. Because uh, we, in parallel, typically when we uh, try and advise how do we manage the uh, risks associated with the cycle, uh, typically we advocate counter-cyclical fiscal policies, whether that's simply just letting the automatic stabilizers work, or even uh, uh, possibly also having activist counter-cyclical measures. Um, but if we have those in place, then uh, again, we, we might calculate that the, that the amplitude of the boom bust cycle is less, and therefore the amount of protection we need from uh, the macro potential buffers is less. Conversely, if those policies are not in place, if fiscal policy is moving in a pro-cyclical way, then uh, that may require a greater offset with macro prudential policy. So that's an interesting uh, interaction to think about. Okay, let me move to the second uh, point I want to make, which is about uh, market-based finance and financial stability. And again, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the publication of the latest EU shadow banking monitor by the ESRB. I think some of the numbers were cited by uh, President Draghi earlier on. Uh, but you know, when you have a, a, a universe which corresponds to about 40% of EU total financial assets, this is a large part of the European financial system. Um, and I think uh, the ESRB can play a, a unique role here in terms of coordinating national efforts uh, to track developments in market-based finance. So uh, I mentioned earlier on the ESRB is really a coalition of the willing across the different uh, member states. Uh, and especially when a lot of the regulation here is national, a lot of the data collection is national here, it, it requires good citizenship, especially by countries with a lot of market-based finance to contribute. Now, why, why should we care? There's really two. One is the scenario where the next crisis comes from a run in the market-based sector. So a, a run on investment funds where if they have illiquid assets and liquid liabilities, we could have a problem. And then second is the, and uh, whether it's independent or interacts with that basic factor, is the banking system relies on the non-banks. About 8% of bank assets in, are invested in these entities and they uh, rely on this sector for about 2.2 trillion in funding. So a problem in the non-bank financial sector quickly will spill over to the banking sector. And we know what happens then. So uh, let me also point out that more and more, uh, we are also aware that there's a link between the non-bank financial sector and the real economy. So one thing we're noticing is the increasing importance of non-banks as credit providers to non-financial corporates and to households as investors uh, in commercial real estate and in resi residential real estate. So you know, if you're trying to understand the housing market now, it's not enough to think about bank-provided credit. Uh, the credit and the uh, other types of funding coming from non-bank intermediaries is increasingly important in some countries.
Uh, so I think, uh, in turn, what does, what does that mean? It means just as we absolutely insist we need to have a good understanding of the leverage, the liquidity, the maturity profiles of banks, uh, equally, we need to have uh, corresponding information for non-bank intermediaries uh, who are providing funding to the real economy. Uh, w progress here is, uh, I suppose, uh, differentiated according to what slice of that you're looking at. So uh, President Draghi earlier on uh, was highlighting uh, the progress we've made at ESRB and EU level vis-a-vis -vis derivatives data and the tsunami of daily data that's coming through there. So, of course, at EU-wide level, it's, it's really important to understand uh, whether these uh, markets are being used to hedge risk, to be risk reduction and risk transfer to those who can absorb it, or being used uh, to uh, have synthetic leverage in an inappropriate way. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, at national level, especially countries with our international financial centres, uh, including uh, my own jurisdiction, it's very important to, to uh, provide uh, the, and publish information on those sectors. So let me uh, mention a couple of uh, studies that we're, we're doing at the central bank. Uh, so in the shadow banking monitor, uh, there's a box which looks into the international linkages of Irish domiciled uh, non-securitization special purpose entities. Uh, so this is a, an area where we have, a, a, under legislation, we can gather information. We don't regulate these entities, but we can gather information uh, on these entities, and it, it proves to be a treasure trove of understanding uh, the, how the international financial system works. Uh, by and large, these entities are irrelevant for the Irish economy, but they are providing links from certain uh, countries of origin to certain destinations. And I think uh, there's a lot to be learned there. So that box in the, in the monitor uh, will, will, give, will give you uh, quite a bit of information. And then the second example from the monitor is this study of uh, credit default, the use of CDSs by uh, usage funds. So this is a, a joint work between uh, our central bank and uh, staff from uh, various e ESRB member institutions. So, uh, by the way, in the Banque de France's uh, financial stability report this spring, uh, m myself and uh, Kitty Maloney, the head of market-based finance at the bank, we, we wrote a, an introduction or overview of this sector in the Irish economy. And again, we have no local financial stability reason to do so. All of this is as a platform, as a host for international activity, but as an international public good, uh, those countries with big sectors, whether it's us or the other big financial se sectors in Europe, should be providing uh, what we can. So let me uh, also, uh, and we, we, I think we've, one of the uh, strengths of the ESRB is its links to the academic community through the scientific uh, ca uh, committee, the ASC. But more generally, uh, the more the uh, opportunities there are for researchers to help in the analysis of all the, all the, all the data we collect, uh, the better. So uh, again, uh, President Draghi already mentioned the uh, Bridge Program for Data Science, the joint ECB ESRB program, and this really, in terms of advertising to uh, researchers out there, provides a great opportunity, uh, which is, I think, a win-win. Uh, provides a, a new data for academics, but with a lot of direct policy relevance. So let me uh, conclude there. That really, the two points I'm making now is. Uh, I think the whole rationale of the ESRB was really to avoid the la what happened before, which is inadequate uh, use of macroprudential policies during upswings. We have an upswing now, so let's use the, the, the instruments that have been made available to us. And then second is the reality is so much of finance has moved away from banks to non-banks that uh, we just have to move forward. It's move forward in terms of understanding through data analysis, and then move forward with the agenda about working out what kind of policy instruments are appropriate for that sector. Uh, so let me, let me stop there, and I, I kind of, uh, I think, uh, allowed some time for Q&A, so I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Who has the microphone? 
French route. Thank you, Phil. It was really a very nice overview. And when you started, um, you said, OK, we, we have these buffers, so we have resilience, so in bad times we can use it uh, to draw down, a bit like uh, with Egypt. Huh? You have the seven years of extra uh, wheat, and then you use it uh, for, the, for the bad years. Could, could it also play a role for slowing down the upswing? Yeah, so that's an interesting point. Uh, you might, I mean, I think the safe way to phrase that is uh, you might think so. But the reality is that uh, what's happening in some markets now is, for example, uh, credit might be restricted. But as I've just mentioned, there are non bank uh, actors in certain markets. So I think it'd be over promising to say uh, not only are we providing, as uh, I say, the buffers for the next downturn but we're actually trying to affect the current dynamics. I mean, I think a lot of time it will have an effect, uh, but I think we're better off not relying upon that because uh, in a market where there are some uh, entities where they're under the constraints, other entities that are not, you know, I don't think it's, a, it's a guaranteed that you can necessarily influence current dynamics. So we would not try and, we would not claim we're trying to target the level of house prices or target uh, other current indicators. It's more to build the resilience for the downturn. Behind. So, Daniel. Yeah. Banks presumably are more robust, more resilient, but, but risks have been migrating towards non, the non-banking sector, shadow banking. Now, Macroprudential policy is also asked to deal with systemic risk uh, in, in shadow banking. But apart from macroprudential policy, now there is a land of last resort function, which in highly critical times should play a role in dealing with a banking crisis. But what about non-banks? If non-banks are huge and operate as big lenders, uh, if something goes terribly wrong with a, non a huge non-bank, or a CCP, for example, I mean, who's going to perform the land of last resort function? A central bank? The ECB, again? OK, okay so, so I think that's a very deep question. Um, and some of the issues that, that, that's raised there is um, you know, entities versus activities. So clearly, is it the case that you're looking, with a bank, you may want to save a bank because it, you know, it, it plays a certain role in the society. Uh, whether you want to save an asset manager or, or uh, some other entity is a different question. But I mean, there's no doubt, typically, uh, any central bank, any monetary system, in terms of uh, the mechanics of having uh, the stability of the currency and so on, uh, typically, liquidity policies are expressed in a generic way. It's not exclusively about uh, whatever banks are on the list of counterparties today. It's usually thought of much more broadly. But equally, uh, in, in a maybe a, a, a way that the, the, the kind of discretion is there to assess at the time what is appropriate, as opposed to uh, to provide some kind of ex ante guarantee that you can uh, just show up and uh, uh, receive liquidity. Uh, let me uh, emphasize also, of course, because it, it, it's important to say it's not the case we think moving that the fact that the financial system now has a much bigger role for non banks is compared to the counterfactual of just relying on banks. Having banks and non banks has to provide more diversification. Uh, if some of those non banks are long only, uh, uh, investors where the, the, the people bearing that risk are well able to bear that risk, that's fine. We have this intermediate category where, where we think about it, which is where it's more bank-like, where the, there's kind of short-run uh, liabilities. Well, uh, the question is whether the investors think they are short-run li safe liabilities or whether they fully recognize these are really uh, much more equity-type investments. So, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty there, but uh, it would be important to say it's not the case that this is um, uh, 
somehow making life worse. It's just a, a new type of uh, system in terms of understanding what, what are the financial stability implications of non-bank intermediaries. Uh, and really the focus is on, number one, leveraged non-bank intermediaries, uh, and number two, this issue where the, uh, the, uh, some in, uh, end investors may perceive the liabilities to be liquid when they're not. So. Richard Portis, London Business School and Advisory Scientific Committee, uh, but also Joint Expert Group on Shadow Banking uh, of the ESRB. And it's in that role that I want to put my question. Uh, I was pleased to hear you say what you said, about, and the President as well, about the Shadow Banking Monitor. Uh, but we're now in the stage of uh, preparing the fourth Shadow Banking Monitor. And as you, you referred to, two boxes in the current one. Uh, in the light of you know, the next crisis, where is the next, how to stop it, et cetera, uh, what boxes would you suggest, what topics would you suggest we might <laughs> devote a special attention to for boxes in the next issue? Thank you, Richard. I think Richard is tr trying to catch me out on the spot, but actually I do have a, an immediate uh, thought about that, uh, which is uh, the interconnection between uh, non-bank intermediaries and property markets. So I can tell you uh, we, uh, we are definitely working on this topic about understanding uh, when you have all of these uh, new types of uh, institutional investors coming into commercial real estate and residential real estate, understanding the balance sheets of those entities. Uh, how much leverage do they have? Uh, where is that uh, debt financing coming from? So I think that could be an interesting, because uh, let me, because I, this one of the things I was trying to say in the speech, historically, and even the phrase shadow banking sort of uh, connotes that you have to think about its relationship to the banking system, but then if you want to think about the relationship to the real economy, it's really through the banking system. Whereas when you have uh, serious amounts of uh, direct lending uh, going on, so whether it's insurance companies providing mortgages, uh, other types of intermediaries being players in the property markets, then that kind of uh, real channel is becoming increasingly important. So I think, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of the phrase shadow banking at this point because um, the, the kind of topic of market-based finance and Part of it is shadow banking, part of it is, is other financial services. You know, I think uh, there's no shortage of boxes, but that, uh, I'll give you one, I'll give you one. Okay. Thank you, Philip. The, the use of the CCB is, of course, a fascinating issue because we know how it works in theory. The question is, how will it work in practice? Um, if I remember correctly, the Swiss National Bank applied a similar instrument some years ago, and um, they somehow felt that it was just not powerful because the real estate market is so strong, you suddenly have so strong inflows, that this incremental increase was not strong. My question is whether you have any observations on the experiences you have observed from other central banks, and if it is not sufficiently effective, what, what are the next steps then? What, what's, what's the plan, so to say? In general. So this goes back to what is the objective? So if the objective is, I mean, I think you can, um, uh, if you have a borrower-based measure that limits the ability of households to take on debt, I mean, we do that. It doesn't matter who's the credit provider, whether it's a bank or a non-bank. So if you operate on the people, you know, on the households, uh, that, can, that can be effective in building household resilience. Uh, if you can operate on the domestic banks, even if other banks overseas. So one historical thing in the mid 2000s was some countries had these measures and the domestic banks just lost market share to foreign banks. Uh, on the other hand, they may not have slowed down the credit boom, but the allocation of losses uh, was redirected. So uh, you can have a lot of gain, even if there's no impact on credit dynamics or house price dynamics. Uh, it's really the allocation of risk. So, um, it would be nice to be more powerful, uh, but even if you s s cannot deliver everything, 
uh, these still, I think, ha have some value, which again goes back to what are you promising? What, are you, what is your objective? Uh, what are you promising? What can you deliver? So I think uh, the inability to uh, control uh, house prices does not mean you, you, you say nothing's possible. You, you do what you can. Okay, I think uh, we, uh, the, the fact that we are 15 minutes ahead of schedule reflects um, President Draghi being 15 minutes uh, ahead of schedule. So I think we're on time. So uh, with that, uh, let me thank you for the questions.